It's Johannan in California. Did I say that right? Yes. Okay, you're on with Tracy and Aaron. Um, what's on your mind today? It says you have an Please. argument for the existence of God. Yeah. So, um, firstly, I'm going to start with uh, a basic epistemic uh, principle or set of epistemic principles. It's uh, very basic. the PSR, Principle of Sufficient Reason, plus the Law of Identity. And we're going to get a little tool out of this. I'm going to call it explanatory continuity. And so this is basically where you start with a, an argument, any argument, with a set of premises. And, you know, when you put that in like a formal logic sense, each premise has terms in it, right? Like A, B, and C, again, in abstract form. Okay. And then you follow through a series of, um, you know, steps to get the conclusion, correct? Okay. So now... If the argument is, now this is, there's other ways an argument can be invalid, but the basic way that an argument, uh, one, one, one way that an argument can be invalid is if there are terms in the conclusion that don't show up in the premises. It means that someone kind of like put terms in somewhere along, like a non sequitur jump from the premises to some step along the way to the conclusion, if not the conclusion itself. Right, so if you have A, B, and C in the premises, and you end up with D, E, and F in the conclusion, you know that someone made a non sequitur fallacy on the way, right? I have a question. If yeah. somebody puts forward a premise that is incorrect, but the people that are hearing the premise don't know it's incorrect, and the person putting it forward doesn't know it's incorrect, and they all accept it, would that make a problem? That would be a problem, but uh, with the second part of this argument that I'm going to get to, you'll see very quickly why that's not an issue in this case. Oh, okay. That's something that literally everyone agrees with, or I'm pretty certain pretty sure. Right. I guess what I'm asking so, is a lot of times, for example, people will put forward a hypothesis that sounds very good. <laughs> like everything about it seems like it should happen the way that, it, that you would expect it would happen. The premises are off. Right, and, but then you test it, and you get this surprising result that isn't what anyone expected, right? Because there's something, and then they have to investigate to see, well, what is it about what we thought should happen that made it not happen? Because everything we know points to this, and then later when you investigate, you find out something new that you didn't know before. Because oh, you, there's this other additional component that fits in. Because you test it, right? Right. right. Yeah. yeah. And I, I just want to clarify just you know what we're talking about. I mean... We're obviously not talking about a Bible God, right? So you're talking about something. Uh, that's actually an interesting thing. If you want to get into that, and this would be, and uh, you know me, Arn, from uh, Facebook. I work on your PEP. Though uh, you might not know that I'm actually J.P. Moreland's um, student, <laughs> or former student. I, I graduated now. But um, with this argument, I can actually, I look at it in comparative religion. Once you get past this, okay, once you get to the, the conclusion of it, you can go from a, a number of different places with it, which are like beyond the scope of this argument. And one of these is very interesting because you can you can have a physics equivalent to this metaphysics. Okay, it's an idealist metaphysics that argue for. But you can have a physics equivalent of it, and from the uh, physics equivalent, you can actually demonstrate the existence of a fallen state. Not just describing Christianity, Wait, but as described in <laughs> the details of it, as described in six separate beliefs. Maybe we should just go let you start. Okay, but that, that, that was actually like a whole lecture. I want to do like a whole like video lecture on that, which would... Oh, you get know, your own show. Your own I'm sorry. Show, I don't want to do that here. <laughs> but actually, it, it has, it, it'll, it'll demonstrate that, if I, if I, that part could demonstrate that God could, there's a basis for what people are calling God and what uh, people are calling theology in comparative religion that's actually based on this metaphysics and not on dogma at all. But put that aside for now. So all, the only reason I asked was, you know, are we going to try to, you know, support the idea that there was a global flood and talking snakes and, you know, a firmament no, and no. all that? Okay, good. Yeah, <laughs> I think, well, if I was uh, thinking there was a global flood, there'd be a serious problem with me being on your phylogeny pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Granted. <laughs> um, anyway, so... Now, are you going to explain with the Kantian phenomenon Newmanon problem? This is sounding an awful lot like philosophy, so I'm just going to roll my eyes back in my head and turn it over to Tracy. No, don't turn it over to me. Okay. I'm, I'm, my <laughs> thing is, just go. Just, just go. What is? What are these premises? Let's lay it out. Let's start. Okay, so the problem of external world skepticism. You have, um, very basic, this is another word for it. You have your perceptions, which is what Kant called the phenomenon, right? Your 
what you see around the world, the, the phenomenology of it, the way it seems to you. People have perceptions. And Next. there is... What? I said people have perceptions. Next. Okay, beyond the perceptions, though, is what I call the noumenon, which is supposedly the mind-independent external reality. Okay, the there's objective There's objective stuff. Next. Yes. And the next question is, how do you get from... We always assume the objective stuff is there, but now, of course, we take that for granted, and we would agree that's there, but in order to actually... For that to possibly be the case, there has to be a way to bridge epistemically the phenomenon and the noumenon. There has to be a way to actually argue that there is something beyond your perceptions. Now, of course, practically speaking, number one, we don't, most people, you know, for practical purposes, it really doesn't matter because we just go about the world pragmatically as though that's the case anyway. And number two, if we tried to sit down and figure out how to solve it, it would be very difficult to, you know, really tackle, right? Right, brain in the jar, next. However, if, science, if, we are, if our perceptions are to correlate to a world outside of our senses, then there has to be, in principle, some logical explanation that bridges the perceptions with the world behind them, even if we don't know it and we will never know it. And for that kind of argument to be logically valid, there can't be terms in the conclusion that are, do not fall from the premises, correct? Yeah, I don't know. Keep going. That was the explanatory. Okay. Just making sure everyone follows. Now, uh, the thing about this is the terms in the premises, you know, when you start, the, the premises you start with are your phenomenology. You have nothing other than your phenomenology to deal with, okay? I, I got to tell you, every time so, I hear you say phenomenology, I think, do, 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 do. Oh, gosh, that's you dated yourself so much. Dated yourself. Sorry. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Um, so how so, do we perceive? You know, so the question here is, how do we perceive? How do we perceive? How is it that our perceptions correlate to a world beyond them? Now, when you think about this, all you have as premises in this case are, um, you know, your perceptions, your phenomenal perceptions, which are purely first per defined first person phenomenal terms. So it's all mental, right? So now the thing is, is that well, I mean, it's mental and premises, mental, mental and fit. I mean, mental is physical, right? Well, we'll get to that. We'll get to the definition of physical a little bit later because the physical is what's in the noumenon, right? Yeah, I don't know. That's I just know that there's stuff. physical stuff, and I don't know of other stuff. Well, the thing is, is you do know of other stuff. Cause oh, okay. You, I mean, well, let's say other stuff. Okay, let's, 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 let's get rid of the word mental versus physical for now because that will bring into a whole bunch of things that could be argued to be question-begging either way and okay. really actually kind of distract from the whole. Let's, let's just say... Whether or not your your perceptions are physical, you have them, and they are first person, right? Right. And furthermore, that's all you know. You can say mental is physical if you want, and that's fine. Yeah, sir. Um, Soft solipsism. I'm with you. Okay. So hey, you know, you this is exactly perceptions. this is exactly why I said turn over the philosophy to you. Okay. All you have is your mental perceptions, mm -hmm. and then. To get to the conclusion, which is the noumenon or the objective world, the terms in the premises have to be the same as the terms in the conclusion. You can't have, you know, new new uh, terms appearing in the conclusion that don't show up in the premises, right? Like A, B, and C can't lead to D, E, and F. If D, and E, and F are, you know, irreducibly D, E, and F. And yeah, if we get to that and it's a problem later, you can explain it to us why it doesn't work. Okay. All right. So A, B, and C in this case are just your perceptions, your mental first-person perceptions. Okay. And maybe other mental things as well. It could be other minds, perhaps, okay. things of a first-person category. Which would still be objective for the individual subject. Yes. Okay. And, and, and I just want to make sure I understand this. Basically, we perceive things, and there appears to be objective reality, but it's basically give, taken on a tentative basis because we have no choice. Okay, and, and you, what you're saying, what the caller is saying, is that this argument is going to convince me there's a God. Well, we're getting there. It's going to convince you of idealism. We're getting there. It's going to convince me of idealism that yeah. reality isn't even real. Well, it's real, but this is objective idealism, which is a different category than subjective idealism. Oh, I'm sorry, there objective? Is a beyond your senses. I'm sorry, you just broke my brain when you said subjective. You said objective idealism. 
Yep. So that so that uh, I made up everything. Uh, I made up everything, including you, and you can confirm that I made you up. No, what it says is that there is a world beyond our senses, but that world is not that it's like subjective in the sense of it's just subjective to me. It's all my hallucination. What it's saying is there is a world beyond our senses, but that world is comprised of entities that have a mental ontology or a mental essence. To them. So it's comprised of more minds that you're interacting with or more. Um, so like this beer I'm drinking is a mind. Yeah. Now that when we get to that a little bit later, there's a. Uh, I mean, that's what you're dying. saying, right? That, that um, these things out that I think are outside me are actually existing with their own minds. Uh, some of them are actually microscopic. This is um, Wait, what? Realism, <laughs> uh, Donald Hoffman from UC Irvine. And he has this very. Yeah, let's keep. Well, let's just keep going. Let's keep going with okay, these well, things. Yeah, yeah. The question is, you're good. I'm sorry. I keep going. side. It sounds, I, like a, it sounds like a radical hypothesis. I take I take full idea. full responsibility for sidetracking it. But let's go ahead and. I, I don't know where the beer. The question of whether the beer is outside your mind made the beer microscopic. I don't know, but it has its own mind. Well, the microscopic mind. The reason I brought that. It up has a microscopic is, mind. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. We're getting there. He has this argument, this is a theory actually, and this is kind of, I wanted, I was going to bring this up at the end because it's like a, it's cool. I know the conclusion is quite radical and I wanted to. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and do your, it's your thing. It's logically, but it's quite radical. And it would so, so there's perception, there's, there's, a, there's an assumption of objective stuff, and then there's a question of how we perceive the objective reality, and then next. Okay, so in order to solve that question, Whatever, there has to be some explanation. Solve what to, question? Wait, is there? A, wait, wait, wait. Is there a question? That that was my question. Was was there a question? <laughs> well, the question is, how do you get? How do you know that your subjective perceptions are corresponding to an objective world beyond them? And I thought we agreed that you can't know that. That you just have to take it. Well, on. You, you 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 can't know that practically, probably. But you have there has to, in order for it to be possible for there to be that. Like if we are if we are going to assume. That it's not just solved. Like really what else would you that. assume? Uh, well, this is a, you could be a solipsist. Now, of course, no one is. Right, but I mean, but let's say I'm a solipsist and I reject this reality that I perceive. What else do I assume? Well, okay, so what else would you assume beyond that? You wouldn't. However, the thing is, is that. Right, and then uh, I would just die, right? This, I mean, this is an argument for the existence of God or the existence of uh, idealist mental reality. But it seems yeah. like we're kind of hitting a brick wall because if we're going to try to. I mean, okay, so we're. Because we're already saying. I mean, I agree with you that the that the acceptance of the objective reality is like a tentative thing, that you do it because it's sort of the right. only option. I'm with you 100% on that. Right. So then the question okay, of how we... Per is, well, when we get to the a condition of that option, right? Right. So, a condition I, of that is because of this, the how, how this problem is set up is that if there is an objective world beyond our senses, then that objective world must be comprised of items with mental ontology. Okay, so keep going because I'm not I'm Wait. not there yet. So good, keep Wait, going. If, if there's a if there's an existent in existence beyond our mental perceptions, I think this is he's skipping to the conclusion and he still has more premises to go through. Am I right? Yeah, well, I got, I got to explain how I would see the, the premises are mostly set up right now. I just have to. I just wanted to understand what I just heard. Yeah, you heard it right. Okay. <laughs> it sounds radical. It sounds radical. I know. I, I can defend it though. That radical is a word. That's... Scientific angle as well as astonishingly as well as from a philosophic angle. Okay. Just using the philosophical because point. I think if we, I just want to say right, like right now, and maybe you can address this when you're doing your premises. Um, how we like assuming that the objective reality is what we perceive, which is kind of where we're stuck, right? I mean, we have to kind of assume right. that it's real. So we assume that this objective reality is real, and so we operate with it based on what we consider to be demonstrated, which is again like our perceptions, either directly or indirectly through mechanisms that can measure. Correct. Right. Okay. So then, right. what happens is we have things like I hear stuff, and the stuff that I hear we can measure through sound waves, right? So the thing that Something is like right. two things get wanna, hit, quick... and then we have sound waves that travel, and we can measure them, and they hit my wanna, ears, which wanna, then are triggered. I want to quick uh, point out a subtle problem here, okay? Okay. And that is, yes, these things correspond to like there's a difference between qualia and the things. Killed. I don't accept um, qualia. Okay, difference between uh, forget the word qualia. Uh, okay. 
uh, first person perceptions and like, for example, when I, when I look at like the color red, right? Okay. I see redness there, but I, what I don't see is light of, you know, a certain number of nanometer wavelength, uh, electromagnetic waves of a certain number, you know. But that is redness, isn't it? Well, that corresponds to redness. It's not the, let me put it this way. That's what redness is. is. If, it, if it wasn't there, there would be no red. I mean, redness is that. It has to correspond well, to the... suppose that you have someone with synesthesia, for example. Okay. And that person may actually, in this case, not hear the color, you know... Okay, so what, what you're red, saying, what you're saying... In what, which case, what you're saying is... There, corresponds. Okay, I just want to clarify. Wait, there's, a, there's a thing called redness, which is on the spectrum of visible light. And you're saying, well, what right, if you well, have synesthesia? To it anyway. And if you have synesthesia, then your brain is rewired such that you perceive smells as sounds and so forth. So you can't perceive anything correctly. So how would you know whether it well, sits that's, on... That's the question. I mean, how do we know that maybe our minds are not... We um... don't. And we've already conceded that. We okay, don't. Okay, well, I mean, well it's not, there's not the, the external skepticism thing. This is the issue of... I, I'm trying to demonstrate that Redness though it correlates to you know. Well, that, uh, no, it's it's like, it's like she it's said. That's what red with. redness is defined as being within this wavelength. Right. I mean, this person is is an anomaly for sure. I get it, and you're right. It it's definitely worth looking into why somebody has this odd experience of of having a perception of red, just like dreams. Right. We could just go to dreams. Yeah, I have all kinds of perceptions, bring up. but I have all kinds of perceptions in dreams that are just sort of mental projections of things that don't really exist, right? I mean, as far as our... But, but from when you're in the dream, the experience, which is the, the first person, I'm trying to get it as not the objective aspect, but the first person subjective aspect of it. Right, but we I would like we would aspect. accept that based on this sort of, hey, we tentatively have to accept reality, and based on how we evaluate that reality, based on that initial acceptance... Um, the dream then becomes non-objective, right? It just becomes something my brain is putting out at night. Like I'm not really holding a lemon. I'm just dreaming that I'm holding right. a lemon. But the thing that this is, is we're, when we're, when we're dealing with the phenomena, none of it is objective anyway. It is all just the first person. Right. So my brain can reproduce these things like yellowness for the lemon, even though it's not really getting an objective input of yellowness. So I understand what you're saying there, and I agree that brains can do that. Okay, so we'll just isolate the subjective aspect of yellowness, which could either be an objective 100-some uh, nanometer wavelength of light, or it could be a mental perception produced by the brain. In the I think I'm going to have to go with the metric. Yeah, I mean, I would say that my brain is reproducing that metric in the dream. Okay, or you could do the synesthesia. Well, let's just focus on the first-person aspect of it, okay? Because this is, this is the, the other, perception. You know, it has this other aspect of the, perception. That, uh, the light of a certain number of right, the perception. Uh, nanometer wavelengths. But we'll just focus on the subjective aspect of it for now, and that is all that's in the, the premises of the phenomenon. In, in the, the terms in the premises, the A, B, and C of the premises, Right. the first-person aspect is like, it's like the first-person aspect of yellow is the A, the first person aspect of the, the blue is the, the B, and the first person aspect of, you know, the C is the red, minus the what they are objectively in the, in the physical world. So, so are we going to go with the idea that we perceive an assumed objective reality, or are we going to say that all goes out the window because dreams? <laughs> well, we're going to go out the window as a provisional for the purpose of, of demonstrating that if there is an objective reality, then therefore certain implications follow from that. So, so he's arguing for, and I'm still having a problem with the broken brain bit on the objective idealism. Because I don't know, I don't know, and I, I don't know a definition of idealism that can be objective. Okay, well, look up, um, okay, let me give you an example. Uh, well, this is called, you look up objective idealism on Wikipedia, it's actually a real thing, but another example. I'm not looking up Wikipedia during the, the show. Term, conscious <laughs> realism, which is Donald Hoffman's term who describes the world as made of conscious agents. He then identifies each conscious agent as a little wave function. Oh. Okay, can, so can wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. wait. The wave function. <laughs> you're, yeah. you're pushing him toward his conclusion, and then we're just taking longer. So okay. what's happening is, okay, so what we've got now is we have perceptions, we have objective stuff that is assumed, and then we have the capacity to perceive things that we also assume are not part of the objective reality. That's where we're at at this point, right? Okay. 
So what I'm doing here is I'm starting with just the part that is the subjective first person aspect of it. The perception. And we'll, we'll suspend all judgment as to, you know, Let's just call that the perception. Length, length really correlates right. so or what have you. We're looking at the but perception. Not, you know. Okay, so now if there is a world beyond our senses, then there has to be a way to get from the premises and the phenomenon to the conclusion of the external world and the noumenon. Right. right. The obje- so you're, you're saying how do we perceive objective reality? Did, did we right. really just spend 15 minutes or more asking the question, how do we know if we know anything? Well, no anything objective. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is we do know them, but the, the, the a precondition of us being able to know them tells us something about their ontology. I just think this is a lot of words to say we perceive stuff. There, we, we accept there's an objective reality, although we cannot demonstrate that as, like, real, and that sometimes our perceptions happen without the objective inputs. I mean, okay. that's literally what we've well, said. No, no, no. Actually, let me, let me, let me state uh, really fast the, the premises, the conclusion, and then maybe it'll give you a different way of seeing what I'm arguing. And I guess, I mean, I thought email. I was a verbose person. Like, really? <laughs> I thought I was like the most, it, you know. It, it, it's philosophy, it's, you know, it, it's, it, it's usually better when it's like I do like a video. It doesn't have to be this break. complicated, though. You can literally just say, we perceive things. There's a, we make an let assumption. Me, let, me make, let me make it simple. Let me make it simple, okay? I'll, 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 I'll say Too the late. And then just pick it apart. <laughs> All right. So we have only the first person subjective aspect to start with, which is the premises and the, conclu- in the, the, the premises of the argument. And the subjective, the, the terms in those premises, A, B, and C, are the subjective elements, okay? Perception. Therefore, if we are able to get to a conclusion from those premises, which that conclusion would be the new man or the objective world. <laughs> I just don't care. It's like I was mostly. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. minute. We're, we're like, we're, in, we're at Meaning five o'clock. Need to be first person. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I don't know if you can't hear me, maybe, but. He's reading. Yeah. Right. We need to. We need to move along at this point because this is way too uh, many words to okay, say something to so it, simple. A, a compact form so you can pick it apart. Yeah, put it at the blog, right? There's a freethoughtblogs.com forward slash AXP. I totally encourage you to, like, put this out in as long a thesis as you think is required to do this. Okay. I think it can be put in, in, like, 50 words or less, but that consider that like a that challenge. <laughs> it, it would be in 50 words or less or if I wrote it. How do we yeah. know if we know stuff? That's We don't need to use, we don't need to define terms. We don't, you just say like, here's what I think and why I think it. And I think that would be fine. If we only start with first person consciousness, we can only conclude first person consciousness, even if that first person sure. consciousness is beyond our own consciousness. Sure. Sure. How's that? Yeah, I mean, we only can understand our, our own perceptions and we have to accept everything else as tentative. And well, the point is, is that, the, that if we are to accept the other things as well, that means they have to be first person as well. If our except what other things? Possible. Well, they don't have to be su- like perceiving subjects, though. I guess is the thing. They can exist without being perceiving subjects. In my okay, view. at what point they have to be? Well, that's the thing, though, because if if they're if they're not or not being perceiving subjects, but if they're not the more mental stuff, right? I don't know what that means. That they're not more mental. E and F in the conclusion rather than A, B, and C. You have like a non-sensor yeah. then, right? Go ahead and put this at the blog where you have all the space in the world. Um, and all like right. I said, you'll need to have your first comment moderated if you haven't posted at the blog before. It takes a couple days. Um, but we're going to have to move on. And I appreciate the call.